Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, and curious readers of the Hebrew Bible. I'm Rosie Candleful, Assistant Professor of Hebrew Bible at Wake Forest University. And I'm Paul Essa, a PhD student in Old Testament Hebrew Bible at Yale University. Our co-hosts Rachel Rand and Tim McNich, as you can see, they are off this week. So, <laughs> Rosie, you are going to be the driver today for Sunday, November 13th, 2024. And it looks like you have got a cut-up job from the LCL today, uh, which is we have passages from 1 Samuel 1, 4 through 20, and then we jump to chapter 2 of 1 Samuel 1 to 10. I'm wondering, Rosie, what have you got for us here today? Yeah, that's right, Paul. We do have a bit of a cut-up job. We've gotten used to that from the RCL, right? A bit of this yeah, and a bit of that. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. We're at the start of First Samuel, but I'm not mad about this cut-up job. And that's because the RCL has managed to do a really nice job of highlighting the story of Hannah, mother uh-huh. to the prophet, priest, judge, and erstwhile kingmaker Samuel. And the prophet Samuel usually gets the limelight um, in passages from these books uh, named after him for Samuel and 2 Samuel. Um, But here we get to take a close up on one woman's struggles and her struggles, particularly with infertility and childlessness and and jealousy, a Mm. familiar theme throughout the Bible um, and Mm. the kind of female characters that we encounter. It's her extraordinary song of victory that celebrates Mm. the surprising upside down nature of God's justice. Um, Here at the beginning of chapter two, Hannah's song, and in it, she sings about how God favors the poor and the weak and the hungry. Um, And that song becomes a pattern for the song of Mary um, in Luke's Mm -hmm. gospel, chapter one, and a song that echoes those of others singing biblical women like Miriam and like Deborah, all of whom celebrate God's justice in their songs of victory. Mm, mm. It sounds like you're hitting at some good stuff here, some (laughs) good juicy preaching stuff here. But before we get there, uh, can you fill us in? A little bit of a background would be helpful. Like what what are some of the historical or literary circumstances within which we read 1 Samuel? Yeah, you're right to kind of point us back toward the context here, right? Because This only highlights, I think, the surprise and the delight of finding an extended edition of Hannah's story, right? So it is not often that we hear women's voices or women's struggles kind of lifted up. So here we're kind of uh, really paying attention to the intimate struggles and sufferings of Samuel's mother at the start Mm -hmm. of this book that's named after him. So essentially, the books of Samuel describe the period of time that transitions the loose confederation of tribes of Jacob, of Israel. Um, that were led in uh, the book of Judges that comes right before from crisis Mm -hmm. to crisis by charismatic but deeply flawed military leaders. So folks like Gideon and Jephthah and Samson, those names might ring a bell. These are the kinds of heroes, deeply flawed heroes that are leading the community. But -hmm. first Samuel begins to um, transition Israel now toward the period of the monarchy that begins with Saul, with King David and with Solomon. And this Mm -hmm. becomes a period of relative stability under a single Mm -hmm. leader and the dynasty then that is established through David. Um, But Hannah's story appears at the beginning of this book. um, And in Mm -hmm. 1 Samuel, right there, she is uh, positioned in the in-between. Still Mm -hmm. a period of deep instability before the monarchy is established. I'm still Mm -hmm. kind of into the period of judges. Her son Samuel will be the last of the judges. And despite the people being in the promised land, The people are scattered and divided. The image here is that the tribes are fractured by distrust. We'll continue Mm. to see that in the stories of the the monarchy. The fact that we focus on this woman, the second wife of an Ephraimite man, a northern tribe, a woman who is deeply loved by her spouse, but Mm -hmm. suffers. Um, And because in this kind of first chapter, we hear the words that the Lord had closed her womb. So the Lord Mm. is responsible on some level, and Hannah and the narrator understand um, that despite all of her um, experience of love and of acceptance by her husband, um, she is is suffering. Um, Mm. And she strikes me as an important character to see, um, recognizing that God is is both responsible for her suffering, but still is ultimately the one to whom Hannah directs her prayer. So among all of these stories of men— It's one woman who draws our attention. And here in chapter one, we find Hannah weeping. 
year Mm. after year as she goes up faithfully to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Um, Mm. And this site should ring a bell for listeners because it's a significant one. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I kind of like, you know, struck into the the story that you're telling here. So tell us, what's what's the significance of Shiloh here for listeners? Right. So here I want to draw back on Judges, right? So the very Mm -hmm. last stories that we hear in Judges also um, pick up on this place called Shiloh. Um, This is the site of horrific violence at the end of Judges, horrific violence specifically against women. So at the end of the book of Judges, which immediately precedes Samuel in the Hebrew Bible, Shiloh is attacked by the men of Benjamin who kidnap Mm. and capture the women of Shiloh, forcing them to become their wives. Um, And this site of violence against women is also at the beginning of Samuel, a holy place, a shrine. Mm -hmm a place of pilgrimage, of worship and sacrifice. And here is where the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord rests. It's the symbol of the presence of the Holy One dwelling among the people. But for Hannah, Shiloh is also a place that reminds her every year of what she lacks and who is responsible for that lack. God has closed her womb and what she most desires at this point, which is a child. And this is a society, lest we forget, uh, maybe not so different from our own, where women are established in some special way by having children, yep. right? A woman with many children is considered blessed by the Lord, right? And many mm. arrows mm. in their quiver, right? Um, mm-hmm. But a childless woman, on the other hand, is suspect, right? Somebody mm. who uh, it might be seen as having been abandoned by God or having done something in some way to not bring God's blessings on their lives. They are yeah. often seen as less than, looked down upon, mm. and judged by their mm. societies, right? So mm. we find Hannah suffering under that burden, right? Weeping, unable to eat, unable to find comfort in the house of the Lord, distressed, depressed, and as we'll see here in the passage, deeply misunderstood by her religious leaders, mm. Uh, mm. and particularly by the temple priest Eli. So we see this kind of egregious moment where a professional mm. minister makes mm. assumptions about Hannah that I think it might mm. be valuable here to slow down and highlight for our listeners. Mm. Mm. Hey, this is, yeah, um, this is, this is such a, um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to hear this. Uh, a pastor who got things wrong, who misinterpreted a situation. Is that like, is that, is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Right, I know you're. I know you're being sarcastic here, right? We often get things wrong. I know, right? Yeah. Uh, but pastors are supposed to get some things right, um, mm. and particularly um, when we meet with suffering among our congregations, right? So it seems to yeah. hurt more that in this passage it highlights the error of a professional minister. Um, yes. Eli is the high priest, right? Responsible for the spiritual leadership of the people. And that magnifies the situation here because the priest Eli sees this woman, Hannah, um, and she has come up for worship. She is Mm -hmm. praying silently, um, but her lips are moving. Um, And in that, her lips are moving. She's pouring out her heart before God. She's completely taken up in this moment Mm -hmm. of prayer, of communion with God. And Eli, unable to really um, comprehend what's actually happening, He speaks with disdain um, and thinking Mm. she is drunk. He rebukes her in verse 13. So he says, Mm. how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put Mm. away your wine, right? It's, these are um, harsh words, right? It's a cutting judgment that perfectly encapsulates his lack of understanding, a basic Mm. misapprehension of Hannah's circumstances and like a lack of empathy, right? With what Mm. was actually, so even if she had been drunk, I mean, I might ask the question of whether this is a response that is appropriate to a minister um, mm-hmm. to give to a congregant, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, I just mm-hmm. want to make sure that kind of um, that listeners, particularly those who are preachers and teachers who have some responsibility, um, maybe might hear how the narrator is kind of drawing upon the situation to highlight how unjust Eli's accusation is. It's really interesting the way. Um, prayer um and postures of prayer um you know in 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 the biblical in most biblical narratives are sort of like especially in the new testament uh spoken off in like sort of drunken terms like you 
you, you remember mm. like several uh, passages in the New Testament, especially like I think in Acts when, you know, the apostles mm. were praying in tongues mm. and, you know, they were accused of being drunk, right? Several places in Eph- Ephesians when, you know, the, the people of God were praying, especially praying in different languages. Those those moments are interpreted as being drunk. I'm I'm not reducing Hannah's situation here at all, mm. but it's just interesting to say, like, to see how um, certain postures of prayer are spoken of and written about being drunk. Right. Mm. Uh, that that being said, that being said, um, mm-hmm. it, it's qu- it's quite unfortunate how the shame of being an alcoholic is also put on this woman who is already struggling and battling with the shame of uh, chatlessness, uh, something that societally she has to, to, to sort of, you know, wrestle with and, 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 and to fight, fight against on a daily basis. And, and, and especially, like you rightly said, coming from Eli, I'm sure would have not only like social replications, but also sort of religious replications that, you know, you're, you're, you're so shamed yourself, like in this way that you come into the temple of God with, uh, with your drunkenness. Yeah, I think I think you're right, especially as um, more conversation happens more openly about spiritual hurt, spiritual trauma that mm-hmm. our congregants go through. It seems valuable to kind of maybe spend a moment here on what Hannah's choices might have been in terms of her reaction here. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how many preachers and teachers will want to go there with this passage, but I mm-hmm. personally was deeply convicted by this scene. Um, Mm -hmm. We are often people with authority and particular training to hold positions of authority and power over others. And it's hard to overstate the responsibility we have toward those who are suffering in our community. Yep. Yep. So Eli's castigation, his dismissal of Hannah is an awful moment, but it illuminates a failure in spiritual leadership at its highest levels, right? And, And that's not just then, but also now. Um, Mm -hmm. But to Hannah's credit, right, she doesn't just leave. Um, Mm -hmm. She immediately speaks up to correct her minister. No, my Lord, she says, I am a woman deeply troubled and I have been pouring out my being, my nefesh, before the Lord. Do Mm. not regard your servant as a worthless woman. And that Mm. line breaks my heart, right, and fills Mm. me also, though, with hope, right? So she stands up for herself. It's it's Hannah's humility and her dignity that touches me there, right? So, no, my yeah. Lord, right? I mean, respectfully still, I, I am, uh, that's not what's happening here. Mm-hmm. Don't regard me as a worthless woman. I have worth. Um, and because I've been speaking with God, right? And Eli, yep. to his credit, he's quickly penitent too, right? And he blesses her. And he may yep. not understand, but he says, go in peace and may the Lord grant your petition, right? So yep. he allows himself to be corrected. He doesn't probe deeply after that, right? He doesn't probe further. I might question that. But but Hannah says, let your servant find favor in your sight. And she goes away and the passage says she's no longer sad. Her face is lifted up. So she's received something from yeah. this flawed minister. And I find that a really kind of redemptive turn in this passage that could have gone in various ways. We know that in our own congregations, maybe even in our own classrooms, they don't end always so well. People 100%. leave maybe the mm-hmm. relationship, right? Mm-hmm. 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 The power of dialogue, right? The beauty of conversation. And I hear you, you hear me, and then we reconcile and move on, right? That sounds like you have a lot more to say. What do you make of this exchange? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of want to, I, I want to kind of pause here, right? And think about with the value of seeing this exchange, because it's, it's such a powerful example of grace um, in, in a kind of a real situation where there's been a, a, a real misunderstanding. And it, it gives me a possibility of how we can forgive each other and even redeem, like uh, c- kind of continue a relationship after making a terrible mistake, right? Mm. So to me, this is a hopeful exchange and one which pastors and teachers might dwell upon. Eli and Hannah each part with peace, despite what could have led to a permanent break. Um, yeah. Hannah doesn't leave and Eli doesn't dig in uh, to be, you know, his position or his authority. Um, yeah. These are two people who could have stood on their pride. And instead, they listen to one another. Um, Eli gives peace even after making a terrible error. Mm -hmm. And perhaps even then, that says something to me. If I can admit when I have been too hasty in judgment, say, of a student as an assistant professor, um, I I could remember Eli's example and receive this kind of grace and forgiveness, a a second chance to build a relationship. Now, we don't always get this lucky, um, but it, it gives me just a moment there to pause before I 
um, decide that a student is one way or another, um, I might just take a moment to ask or a moment to observe. Um, and if Eli had done that, m- maybe that you know kind of moment of misjudgment, he 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 wouldn't have had to go that far. Mm, mm. And I think the kind of reconciliation that happens here speaks a lot about what happens in the in, in the next few verses afterwards. Because I think, if I remember correctly, correct me, uh, Rosie, that Hannah gives this young son after he had the son to Eli to raise, right? And, and this minister who got the whole situation wrong, how could he be trusted with the whole parenting responsibility? You see what I right. mean? Right. I find that amazing too, Paul. I mean, I'm not sure I would have been able to do the same. I don't know what you think about that, but like Hannah promises her son, this one that she's been waiting to, Samuel, he, she promises him to God. Mm-hmm. But that means that she will wean him and leave him with Eli yeah. to be raised under his instruction and care to be mm-hmm. a Nazarite and a priest. She's going to dedicate her son to God's service, but until then, she she keeps him with her and does not go up to Shiloh again. The next time when she appears, it is after Samuel's been weaned and she brings her young son. I don't, I mean, probably only about three years old, three, four yeah. years old, maybe to yeah. Eli, the priest. Mm-hmm. That is a real, uh, a real moment of vulnerability and risk, right? She's going to leave this son to Eli. And when she brings him, she says that she is the woman who has been praying that, that mm-hmm. the years ago. And it was her prayer that was answered, right? So that passage ends surprisingly with both worshiping together at Shiloh. So I mean, yeah. profound, um, profound trust um, in God's leadership, you know, despite failure. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know, and after Hannah leaves her son um, Samuel at Shiloh with Eli, we find this prayer, this like really beautiful prayer in First Samuel two. So what's going on with with the prayer? Right. So this is the victory song that Hannah sings, and it is a deeply surprising song in and of itself, right? Mm-hmm. It begins with, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your victory. Mm-hmm. And it repeats a line from the song of the sea. So the song at Exodus, there is no one holy like the Lord, no That's one right. besides you, no yeah. rock like our God. So kind of a kind of a backwards and forwards look. And then it goes on to describe these dramatic reversals. The mm-hmm. mighty and the arrogant are brought low. Those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The Lord makes poor. The Lord makes rich. The Lord brings low and the Lord exalts, right? The mm-hmm. only reference to children and motherhood here in this song is a bit oblique, right? There's a line mm-hmm. that says the barren has born seven. Um, as we know throughout the Hebrew Bible, a kind of a perfect number. And she who has many children is forlorn. She becomes weak. She is feeble. She's even sick, right? That is a surprising turn. That's not what we usually find of the woman who has many children. The song then ends with a praise for a monarchy that we know has yet to be established in Israel. Mm. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, she sings. God will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. So kind of a Mm -hmm. look forward then to what her son will establish in the monarchy. Mm -hmm. This is a surprising and a subversive song that Hannah sings, and mm. one that liberation theologists, um, liberation theology writ large, has seen in its fulsome political potential, right? That's so right, I yeah. am remembering the great theologian, pastor, and teacher, Gustavo Gutierrez, who passed on <laughs> October 22nd. So mm. we're recording this week. Um, um, it will be some weeks yet when, when you listen to this on November 13th. Mm-hmm. But this is a song that Gutierrez has also seen that, mm. um, that showcases the preferential option for the poor, the weak, mm. and the hungry. I, I remember the song, um, the, the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, right? Which is... Yes. Which is which is also a very pivotal um, passage in in among liberation theologians, which is like a um, an advocacy for for the poor and and to make food available for for those who need it. And I think that um, Hannah's song here sort of resonates some of that language. And I'm glad that you bring you bring this up. So how how might you help preachers with uh, with with your task here for this week? Let's start with some pitfalls. So one major pitfall is one that we have talked about before, um, and that is kind of creating the happy ending um, out of Hannah's successful birth. And uh, quick, mm-hmm. quick quotes around successful, right? Um, I want to warn preachers away from smoothing over the radical nature of these texts, right? Yeah. They give voice to the pain of women, right? And so, and that is kind of an extraordinary thing to really hear Hannah's suffering. Um, and I, I, 
I'm a, I'm a little daring to say mm-hmm. that in this fraught political moment in our country, right, yep. um, in the wake of, a, of national elections by November 13th for mm-hmm. president, mm-hmm. where rhetoric concerning women and reproductive rights have been extraordinarily loud, right? Ooh. So yeah. I don't know how preachers could ignore that as we read these passages. And I can't help but hear something in these texts that I think pastors could take the opportunity to grapple with. Now, mm-hmm. I don't know that it points to any particular political position, but I, I think it's important to say what the text is doing, right? right. Um, between 1 Samuel 1 and 1 Samuel 2, mm-hmm. Hannah connects her struggles to have a child with political power, right? So she just does. kind of reversals are not abstract, right? Yep. She is thinking, as you said, right, of, of giving bread to those who are hungry mm-hmm. um, and that that is God's work, right? And that is a political position, not just mm-hmm. a spiritual one. So I want mm-hmm. to kind of point out again, with, you know, in line with Gutierrez and other theologians that think about these texts, these are not just pretty statements. These are radical and subversive ideas of how political power should be used mm-hmm. to serve the poor and the weak, and that this is in line with God's message and God's mm-hmm. ultimate plan for the world. Mm-hmm. is to do right by these mm-hmm. people, to do justice for these people. So she sees God's ability to turn the world upside down in her personal story, in her ability to commune with God and receive an answer in prayer. Mm-hmm. And this is not to say that these texts advocate again for a p- particular political position, but I do see Hannah making a connection between justice writ large and her own answered prayer for a child. I see that too. The other kind of thing I, you know, maybe want to highlight for pastors is I, f- I find a really interesting connection to our gospel reading this week, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which is taken from Mark chapter thirteen, verses one through eight. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this passage, the disciples and Jesus are coming out of the Jerusalem temple, and the disciples marvel over how large the stones are, how great the buildings are in Jerusalem. But Jesus responds in this kind of, you know, warning way. Not mm. one of these stones will be left upon each other. Each one will fall. So this kind mm. of apocalyptic mm-hmm. um, sound to Jesus' response over the you know, kind of disciples marveling. The disciples then want to know when this will happen. And Jesus warns them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many mm. will come in my name claiming I am and lead folks away, right? Mm-hmm. So wars, earthquakes, and famines will come. But this is just the beginning of the birth pangs. Mm. So I would not have paid attention to this final line here had I not been primed by Hannah's story in the first reading of our text this week. Yep. Um, and in some way, that kind of helped me hear uh, what Jesus is saying and, and wonder about what Jesus means with this very poignant language. And when he says this is just the beginning of the birth pangs, Mm-hmm. What does this mean when we put it into conversation with Hannah and maybe even further with our own stories, you know, yeah. um, our own common stories of birth pains? Yep. Yep. I, you know, I, in some way I, I see, I'm also curious to hear what the writers of the Austeel also thought about when they put these two passages together, because, you know, 100%, I wouldn't have thought about uh, the bad pangs here in the Mark passage. If I if I'd not read the Hannah thing, right? I, I I wonder where all of this is going and I wonder what you think about this also, Rosie. I honestly am not sure exactly how to connect them, but I think you're right in that the RCL kind of cr- creates a connection between these passages that it maybe invites us into kind of a, a deeper meditation and maybe a seeing of what's going on. Like as you said, both of us have have recently had our first children, right? So our first mm-hmm. child, both of us have have daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, and the beginning of birth pangs, especially in a first birth, maybe some of our listeners might uh, recall this time, mm-hmm. it doesn't always mean the start of birth, right? So mm-hmm. I had all kinds of pains in those final weeks. Mm-hmm. I was hyperconscious of my body, heavy with child, knowing it could be any day now. Mm-hmm. I also experienced false pains, right? So pains that were alarming, but didn't mm-hmm. actually mean that it was time to go to the hospital, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they were just pains, but we would call the doctors in our alarm and make sure that we checked them out. I was an older pregnancy, so you know we had uh, kind of additional levels of observation on it. Right. But I needed those experienced voices, um, help from caregivers trained and specifically equipped to help me understand how to respond to these pains, right? Mm. So- um, I'm, I'm not even sure, but I, I kind of see also a connection back to Eli, also somebody who's trained and equipped 
um, to be able to help the nation um, mm -hmm. kind of work through their pains, right? Jesus also kind of uh, kind of calling to ministers to be aware. Mm -hmm. Don't yep. just follow these pains wherever you think they might lead. Don't it's not you don't know that that's coming from me, right? So mm -hmm. why is Jesus calling the experience of disasters, of war, of earthquakes, of famine, the beginning of birth pains, right? What what could yeah. that mean with Hannah as a companion? She who interpreted her own birth of Samuel as a revelation of God's inclination to side with the weak, the vulnerable, yep. the poor, and the hungry. I don't know how to connect these two things. Yeah. But I, I think there is something mysteriously right mm -hmm. about hearing Hannah and Jesus together this week. Mm. Because Jesus compares us all to women heavy with child and offers us the experience of those anxious days before the birth of that child, which Indeed. are full of risk, right? And yeah. so we kind of talked about that in our last week's episode, this idea of risk, but also full of hope, full mm -hmm. of uncertainty and danger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a valuable preaching angle here. I'm not exactly sure how to shape it, um, but it asks us all to imagine what is next, not, yep. not to deny that anxiety and uncertainty, but also to say, what is the life that is to come that we are together to create, mm. um, together to lean into the experience of those kind of spiritual leaders that are, that are with us, but also to trust our own bodies and our own experience of pain, right? So, yep. um, so the disciples want to know the day and the hour. Mm -hmm. But Jesus merely warns them that the crises of our day are just the beginning. Um, and I needed the experience of others to help me discern between what was false labor pain and the real yeah. thing. Yeah. So I wonder if pastors and congregations might consider these two passages together to see what richness and what wisdom emerges in the midst of our, our own daily crises that mm. we, we are living into in, in, our, in our own world and our contemporary mm -hmm, situations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I see that and I, I and I see the way you're offering preachers a lot of good things to think about. So preachers, you you do have a lot of good things, but you also have some homework to do. So so uh, take this as a homework moment and you know reflect on you know, all these really beautiful things and, and let's see where, where you can go. But I see a lot of fruitful discussion here, really powerful moments here. Thanks for helping us, Rosie, with this passage loaded with so many layers of different things. Uh, your hard work is very evident here. Well, you're very welcome. I hope someone can find something on how to put those threads together. By all means, by all means. Well, friends, we hope you found something helpful in our discussion today. I'm sure you did. Remember that you can find an episode on nearly every passage in the lectionary by using our search box on our website, firstreadingpodcast.com. Um, and while you're there, take a look at our merch. We have t-shirts, we have mags, we have you know beautiful items that you can send out as gifts. Thanksgiving is coming in the corner. You know, think about us. Or make a donation to help us um, keep the podcast going. I want to say a big thank you to everybody, everybody who has made a donation already. Subscribe, send us a comment, leave us a review. And until next time, my name is Paul Essa. And I am Rosie Cannibal, and have a great week, preachers. Yeah. Yeah.